Hey everybody, welcome to this Beneath the Bible video. Right now we're doing a series called Before You Read. We know that the Bible can be difficult to understand, hard to comprehend, hard to understand the background, and so in this series we're wanting to uh, just provide you with some resources and basic information and historical background to help you interpret the Bible better for yourself. Here's today's video. The book of Zephaniah is concerned with one thing and only one thing, the day of the Lord. This is an apocalyptic vision of divine judgment against Judah and the nations. Zephaniah condemns both religious syncretism and corruption among the country's elite. The judgment on the nations is called the day of the Lord, which is described in the first chapter. The nations are called to prepare and seek the Lord before the judgment can come to pass. The consequences are detailed in chapters 2 and 3. However, the book ends on a hopeful note that there is some possibility for those who are faithful to avert God's judgment. The book's author is stated as Zephaniah, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah. That's quite a family tree to unpack. Now, this is, somewhat unusual, this is a somewhat unusual introduction for a prophet. It gives four-generation pedigree for the author without giving the place of his origin. We often see other minor prophets identified by either a place of origin or who the prophet's father was. And other times we're just given their name. In Zephaniah, we have a more significant introduction. When we look at the names and the ancestor of the prophet, we see three have what are called theophoric names. Now, this means they have part of the divine name Yahweh in their name. Gedaliah means Yah is great or the Lord is great. Amariah means Yah speaks or the Lord speaks. And Hezekiah means Yah is my strength or the Lord is my strength. The name Zephaniah means something like Yah has concealed or who the Lord has hidden, something like that. Having a Yahwistic theophoric name is surely a good sign for a prophet who calls out religious syncretism or the blending of beliefs and practices from different faiths. And looking at other names in the Bible, we see other theophoric names like King Saul's son Eshpa'al, meaning Baal exists or something like that. But this is a non Yahwistic theophoric name. Um, finally, the name Cushi means my Ethiopian, which likely means someone in his family, perhaps a grandmother, was Ethiopian or from the land which was called Cush in biblical times. The Hezekiah in, the, in this list may well be the reformer King Hezekiah. And this would be in line with the theme of the book, that religious syncretism will be the doom of Judah. An ancestor of the famous reformer King, Zephaniah would be the ideal standard bearer for this message. And if Hezekiah in Zephaniah's heritage is this king, it may also explain why Zephaniah is introduced with this kind of identification and not a place of origin. And if he is the great grandson of the king, that would be enough to identify him. Zephaniah certainly seems to be among the urban elite in Judah. He has knowledge of what palace life is like, and he's particularly concerned with the behavior and actions of the elite in Judahite society, who were perhaps his peers. One final note about the text's author is that the text of Zephaniah is somewhat complicated. Uh, some scholars have suggested the text has been corrupted over time, which would explain the grammatical and syntax complications. However, more and more scholars are recognizing that rather than being a corrupted text, this is just a technical work of poetry and it conforms to particular poetic styles and norms from its time period. It is a sophisticated book of poetry and certainly a product of an educated elite and not necessarily the product of multiple literary strata and textual manipulations over time. It seems this book was written during the lifetime of Zephaniah in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, according to the first verse. Josiah reigned from 640 to 609 BC, and the message of Zephaniah seems most likely to have been given early in Josiah's reign. Some scholars have suggested that this is a collection of Zephaniah's prophetic teachings, a sort of summation of his prophetic work rather than a single work. His message of you better reform or else was likely repeated in many ways over a long period of time, and what we have preserved is a summary or collation of his message of reform. There are no issues with seeing this as even being done by the prophet himself at some point in his life. As we noted, these teachings and warnings are given during the reign of Josiah. Josiah took the throne as a young boy, eight years old according to 2 Kings 22. In 2, Kings, in 2 Chronicles 34 states he sought after the God of his ancestor, David. And it's important to note that while Hezekiah, who reigned from around 729 to 687, was a reformer king, his son and grandson Manasseh and Ammon were not. Manasseh reigned for 55 years, and those were largely peaceful and prosperous years in Judah. This was in part because he was a loyal vassal of Assyria. But while being a vassal of Assyria brought peace and prosperity, it also came with the installation of Assyrian cult objects in the Jerusalem temple. Ammon, Manasseh's son, reigned for only two years and did nothing to change the religious situation in Judah. 
So this is the setting of Josiah's early reign. He came to the throne with widespread syncretism and non yahwistic worship, not only throughout Judah, but even in the temple in Jerusalem. The biblical text tells us Josiah began to reform religious practices in Judah and purge the temple of non yahwistic worship in and around the year 621 BC. We see this in 2 Kings 22, where Josiah begins to reform and his humility before the Lord is what saves the nation and postpones the fate that Zephaniah had predicted. Some scholars have suggested that Zephaniah may have been part of the reforming impetus in the Josianic palace. Like Josiah, he was a great grandson of Hezekiah and he was in Jerusalem during the reign of Josiah. It may have been Zephaniah's prompting that got Josiah to start reforming Judah's religious practices. This is of course speculation, but it is a possibility supported by what we know about the prophet. Now, the book of Zephaniah employs a lot of martial imagery and scenes of doom and destruction. Some scholars have tried to link this to a particular military episode or time of destruction, but this effort has been largely unsuccessful. This was a period of instability in the ancient world. The Assyrian Empire, which had been the dominant power in the world for over a century, was in its death throes. After the death of the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal in 731, there were several decades of warfare and rebellions against the Assyrians as the Chaldean kings in Babylon and their allies in Iran and elsewhere began to chip away at Assyria's control in their provinces and cities. The Assyrian capital of Nineveh was destroyed in 612, and the empire effectively ended in 605. This period of instability, the collapse of a traditional power, was an opportunity for other states to assert power and control, but also to opportunistically raid and plunder. Now, one such instance was a campaign by a group called the Scythians. Uh, there were a people who were allied with the Babylonians against the Assyrians and the Egyptians, and they raided into Syria-Palestine. Some have seen this as the precedent alluded to in Zephaniah, but this particular campaign is very poorly understood. We don't even know how exactly, when it was, and what exactly happened. It's, it's not clear if the Scythian campaign reached as far south as Judah, and if so, if they even went up into the hills around Jerusalem, or if they just stuck to the coast. So while some have attempted to find a particular historical context for the themes of Zephaniah, it is probably better to simply recognize that Zephaniah is rooted in a very tumultuous period of history. The prophet is using the potent and unfortunately familiar themes and images of his time to communicate the possibility of impending final judgment. He's perhaps just using the unsettled nature of the period in which he lived to communicate truths about the day of the Lord's judgment, along with hope for the faithful in the midst of it. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. If you liked what you saw, be sure to give it a thumbs up and take a minute to share this video with your friends. You can also connect with us online on Twitter and Facebook at Beneath the Bible or on our website, BeneathTheBible.com.